Okay, you guys, welcome to the podcast. This is the Julie Jepson podcast. You know, Laura has been through a lot more than most moms, more than a lot of women, at least physically. I'm Laura. I'm I'm married to Brian Griffiths, and we have two little kids, and they're awesome. Yep, I do hair for a living and just love it. Love talking to people. I brought her on because she is the epitome of grit. Oh, that's so nice. whole family. <laughs> I served a mission after high school and I went to Brazil. And when I was out on my mission, my dad, you know, you get that dreaded phone call. My dad was sick. It, I was maybe three months from coming home and my dad was sick. And so they asked if I wanted to come home. They didn't know if he was going to make it. He had an autoimmune disease, really rare. And they hadn't caught it for almost a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, you know, he was stable and they thought maybe he would be doing better. So I decided to stay out on my mission. But a few months after I got back from my mission, he ended up passing away from that autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. And that was, it was hard. I mean, it's, you just never think that you're going to be that person that loses a parent in your early twenties. Right. So that kind of was the start of like my life. What was it called? <laughs> really what getting Wegener's granulomatosis. And so, but ultimately he died from, um, shingles. Like he mm. wasn't taking, because he was immune suppressed. So he had shingles head to toe in his nose, on his eye. I mean, everywhere, like, like cold sores oh everywhere. Oh my gosh. It was so bad. Like his suffering was so intense. Six and a half weeks in the hospital. I mean, it was really hard. Like it was a really hard thing to go through. I mean, watching your parents suffer mm -hmm. so bad. And I was just fresh off my mission. So I was weird anyway. <laughs> You know, like you're just in a weird state and it was hard. And so, yeah, we watched him pass away and just, mm -hmm. it was time, you know, mm -hmm. but I think the, the weird thing about that whole situation, like, honestly, after that happened, I was like, Hey, we did it. Like heavenly father is going to like check the box. But yes. like, Hey, the Ethington's like we done. had their trial and now they're done. Like, I really believe that. I thought the same thing in my family and I'm like, I think it was done. No, it's Uncle. Excuse, my brother, Michael Ethington. He's a piano artist, has CDs out. He's amazing and fun and funny. Like everyone loves Michael. He is like our family, mm -hmm, right? Like he's mm -hmm. just the best. And um, just a few years after my dad passed away, they they think that he had um, ALS. Mm. So that was a huge hit, obviously, for our family. Like there's no way, like he could have ALS. Like he could die in five, six years, mm -hmm. you know? But shortly after Michael's uh, diagnosis of that, um, my mom was diagnosed with a terminal cancer and we were like, there's no way, like I'm 20, like I'm like 20, I would have been maybe 20, 23, 24 at the time. And I'm sitting here thinking like, I'm going to be an orphan. Like my parents are going to pass away in my twenties. Like all of us are like, we always laugh because we're like, we have one foot in the grave, <laughs> like one foot on land. Like we're all just like, it's kind of, we just tease each other because yeah. it's like a race to the finish. Like who's, you know, what's going to happen. <laughs> and it's not the race you want to win. It's not the race you want to be in. <laughs> yeah. Her cancer morphed and we almost lost her. She's just like the glue of our family. Like it has been such a blessing that mm. she's alive, but it's been hard throughout this period, you know, like everything going on with my mom, everything going on with my brother, um, you know, having lost my dad, but then like Brian and I, we went through seven years of infertility. I believe 2017, 2018, um, my brother-in-law took his life. And so that was a huge hit. My mom had just kicked cancer's butt. Like she had just finished her chemotherapy and everything that she was doing. And then my brother-in-law took his life, which was such a hit, right? Cause it's like here, my mom's like fighting yeah. the world to just be to here. Stay. Like you get through this wave. And then you like come up for air and you're like, okay. <laughs> and then you get hit with the wave again. I had nursed Deanna for like seven months and, um, and then I ran out of milk. And so I stopped nursing her and she was maybe a year and a half. And I was just sitting at the kitchen table and I just felt like a, you know how, like when you're nursing, you just feel like you just can feel when your milk lets so down. Let down yeah. yeah. It felt like let down. And I looked down and I just had this little like quarter size wet spot. And I was like, weird. I I honestly thought it's probably just, it was probably Left just over. like a clogged up little yeah. duct and it just finally released and I'm good okay, to this go. This is TMI, but you can actually, I mean, I've tried this and my <laughs> sister's like, like you can see yeah, the yeah. nipple and some, uh, yeah, some and you'll get totally. No, and it is even, like, even it's common, right? My baby's three. Yeah. And it's just out of curiosity. You're like, I wonder if there's anything in there. It, so. Totally. <laughs> I had had a dream and I don't dream about my dad very often. Mm -hmm. But I had had a dream and he came to me and he just, he, he expressed that he loved me. And then he said, by the way, you have cancer. 
but it was weird because that kind of like sat with me. For me, I felt like my whole journey was like given to me, like which sounds so weird, but it was just a gift for me. Like the way that everything happened, like I really felt like it was just given to me mm. to preserve my life. Mm. But every time, you know when you crisscross to take a shirt off, mm -hmm. every time I would bump that side, it was tender. Mm. Like, you know, before you, you know, I mean, it's like so much information, but before you get your period, how you just get tender there. Yeah. And so it was kind of tender, but always. And so every time that I would bump it and it was tender, that thought of like my mom and, and my, my husband, they were like, go get it checked. So I'm sitting in her office and she's like, okay, like, let me tell you all the reasons why you could have discharge. She's like, cancer isn't discharge unless it's bloody. So I don't think it's cancer mm. and cancer doesn't hurt, which mm. is weird. Cause those were my only two symptoms is it hurt. So you're feeling good. So I'm like, okay, good. And so I left and as I was walking out the door, I'm like, well, should I keep my mammogram on Friday? Like two days later, she's like, might as well. And that's what she always talks about. She's like, and then I told her, <laughs> might as well keep it. And I'm like, okay. That's going like, to be the thumbnail. <laughs> might as well. Might as well. And I'm like, I mean, you basically told me none of my symptoms were cancer, but. So it was, she did a breast check, didn't uh -huh. she? Did like no anything? lumps, nothing. I go Friday, you know, to my mammogram. And they do everything and I'm sitting in the and room. Is this your first mammogram too? Yeah, ever. Because mm. I was 30, I would have been 36. Because the mammogram will pick up masses, but the ultrasound picks up like different tissues. Mm. So it's just an extra precaution. Mm. And the mammogram, he's like, things look really good. He's like, I'm not seeing anything. So I'm sitting in the room waiting for the radiologist to come in. And he sit and while I'm sitting there, I just say a little prayer and I just say, Heavenly Father. I feel like there's more. Is there going to be more? Like, is this cancer? And I just had this weird, like this warm feeling, like enter my head, like go through my body, leave my toes. And I just was like, I have cancer. No way. It was so weird. And it, and, and then the door opens and the radiologist comes in and he's like, listen, he's like, you have these weird little spots. He's like, they're, they're, um, they're like little calcium deposits. He's like, which is really normal. It's a breast. It makes milk, so mm -hmm. calcium. Mm -hmm. He's like, but what we want to do is we want to go in and biopsy and just, you know, just to be safe, just to make sure. And so they put this tiny little, they call it a little clip. And what the clip does is it marks where the cancer is, right? It marks where they take the tissue out mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. um, so that they know where to go back if it is cancerous. And if it's not cancer, then you just can have the little clips in there so they know kind of your history. Mm -hmm. um, they biopsied and came back as being cancerous. So then my next step was a lumpectomy, right? But wait, whoa, we're just brushing <laughs> over like the cancer diagnosis. So how did yeah. they tell you? Yeah, you got a so, so yeah, oh yeah. And the doctor just said, you have cancer. Um, you have DCIS, was it ductal carcinoma in situ. Mm. And so I'm sitting there thinking like, that sounds huge. Yeah. And like, we were just getting ready to try for our, we wanted to extend our family. We have seven years of infertility. Like we have this little tiny family and we want to extend it. But now like I'm possibly like now I'm going through breast cancer. I have to do radiation and then taking a pill for like 10 years or however long to make sure my cancer doesn't come back. And like I, I like you feel it's oh, scary. Yeah, it's daunting. And overwhelming. Yeah. And I was like, okay, this changes like my whole trajectory in life. Yeah. Like yeah. everything that you think that your life is going to be. And your mom's probably like. You'll be fine. Oh, please. I've had it for 15 years. She's like, whatever. <laughs> I think what you were saying, like, it's like the hard, the nice thing with going through trials is that like people who have been there mm. just have like empathy for it. Mm -hmm. Like it's hard to have empathy until you've been through it. Mm -hmm. And I think that like, it sounds weird to say, but like being in all of these situations, like losing a parent, like having a brother with a, a terminal illness and a mom with cancer and a brother-in-law who committed suicide, like, and then you lost and, your niece. Uh, oh yeah. Like my niece passed away. Like, we, I mean, it's, it's been rough, like infertility, but it makes me like, like how you say, like being a hairstylist, like, I just feel like I can connect so well with people mm -hmm. because I've just been through so much mm -hmm. and I get a call from the hospital and I'm like, okay, so I answer it. Is it the same day as your appointment? Same day, like an hour, like maybe an hour or two later. And it's the radiologist. And he's like, he's like, I was looking back on your mammogram and I'm, I'm just confused. I just had a question. He said, have you had more than one biopsy? And I said, nope, I just only ever had that one biopsy. And he's like, okay, you still have your biopsy clip in your breast. 
And that's not supposed to be there? No, because remember, like, if they take out the biopsy clip in the lumpectomy, like, if you have cancer, that biopsy clip is marking your cancer. Yeah. So when you get a lumpectomy, that needs to go, because that's marking where your cancer was, right? They freaking left it in there? Yeah, he left the clip in my breast. And what would happen if that stayed? Well, and that's what I asked him, because I was so confused. I'm like, wait a minute. I'm like, so if I still have the biopsy clip that was marking my cancer, does that mean that I still have cancer? Yeah. Because that makes sense, right? Like, that needed to go. And he's like, I have never seen this happen before, ever. Question. If I were your wife or your child, like, how would you, like, is this pretty disconcerting? And he's like, yeah. But my surgeon, who was a general surgeon, just totally played it all off. Like, didn't act concerned. I had, like, a lot of questions for him. And he's like, he's like, I'll tell you what. Tomorrow, Thursday morning, all of the surgeons get together and we all talk about our patients and their cases. So I will bring it up and then see what people recommend. And then I'll let you know, I'll call you back and let you know. And so I was like, okay, never heard from him. Oh my gosh. Never called. I met with my oncologist and he told me also, he's like, I have been an oncologist for 30 years and I have never seen this happen ever. I just, I came across these awesome surgeons and set up my double mastectomy. I was super prayerful about it. I mean, it's such a big decision. Oh, yeah. And my cute mom was like, you don't just opt to cut off body parts. Because <laughs> she had had, like, her kidney gone. And she had, like, her, you know, like, her thyroid removed. And she's like, you don't just opt to cut off body parts. But I just, in my, I just felt that's what I needed to do. Yeah. And so I went in and um, doctor reading, you know, she did the, the mastectomy, cut everything off. And then Dr. Hijawi started the reconstructive part of it all. Um, huge surgery. So and, you did it all in one. Yeah, well, I mean, it, I've had five reconstructive surgeries. Oh, my gosh. So, but, like, the start of it, right? So they put these, like, they actually wire onto your rib cage a bag. And then they slowly, like, you have to go in um, every, every few weeks. And they just slowly fill it up with mm. liquid mm -hmm. so, that, so that you can get, like, basically stretching you to the size you want to be. Yeah. So that your skin doesn't thin out and yeah. whatnot. And so it was a long process. But I remember the day after my mastectomy, Dr. Reading called and she said, you were right to do a double mastectomy. She said, we found over an inch of aggressive cancer where the clip was. Oh my gosh. So in nine months from the mistake where he had left the clip to where I had my mastectomy, my cancer had grown over an inch of aggressive cancer. And she's like, you made the right decision. Oh my god. Which was like, oh my gosh, thank you. <laughs> Cause that's like, I just like got rid of like, a yeah, really important saved your life. part of my life, you know? And listen, like I've gone through so many things and my sister-in-law always says, it's better to say something imperfectly than nothing per mm. imperfectly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I love that because people are just trying to help. like. People will say dumb things yeah. and that you're just, like, you like leave and you're like, that was so inconsiderate. But I had so many people that were like, oh, it's a good excuse for a boob job. And I'm like, that's my this isn't a boob job. Yeah. Like, like if you saw, like, this is a train wreck that yeah. I'm trying to like make look normal so I can feel like a woman. Right. Um, but, but you know what? I'm so glad that people say dumb things because it means that they don't, they've never been through it. And yeah. I don't want people to go through yes. it. Yes. So like when people say dumb stuff, this is my advice, just be grateful that they don't know because you don't want people to know what suicide is like or what um, cancer is like or losing a parent. Like just be grateful that somebody's saying anything because mm -hmm. some people don't know what to say, so they don't say anything mm -hmm. at all. And mm -hmm. like my cancer journey was really lonely, like really lonely mm -hmm. it, because I don't know, I think people are nervous to ask or people don't know what to say or people don't realize like how hard it was yeah. like it is well because you you're so such a you, you're uplifting and you've got a positive attitude but on the inside you're scared and hurt yeah so my fourth surgery i had was going to be my last yeah and um you know you have to wait like the six weeks until you like get back into normal living and i'm just i'm one of those people like i'm pretty high to pain tolerance mm -hmm. i kind of try to prove like i'm tough like i can do a lot and it was like the fourth of july and I was just swimming with my kids, throwing them up in the air a little. And I just felt a rip and I, like, it scared me. I'm like, I just like felt a rip like that. And it hurt, like it hurt so bad, my right side. And so went throughout the night, like continued doing family stuff. When I went home, I, as I was changing, I looked down 
and there was like a indent like a like I could put my finger like in this indent and I'm like I just so, totally messed up my surgery like totally oh messed gosh. up like I didn't know what I did so I called my surgeon went in and he was like I don't know exactly what's going on but we have to reopen you up and we have to see like something is obviously wrong like sent pictures and everything so fifth surgery went in I had torn the cadaver skin oh in my half. gosh oh my I gosh I ripped it had, at that and point had it become like your cells like hey, yeah so like, it was painful somewhat but not like I mean mm. it was still healing right yeah and so I had completely torn how long everything. after your surgery then was that like seven weeks okay so then I'm back into a fifth surgery, oh right? So I go back in surgery and sur sure enough, rip. he's like, I have never seen someone rip the cadaver skin like that. Of course, right? Of course it's like, you. Like, that was me. It's like, <laughs> of course you haven't. Like, first you've never seen the clip left. Yeah. And now it's yeah. like, <laughs> you've never seen someone rip the cadaver. Because it's supposed to be like super yeah. amazing. Yeah. And like the, the nurse who's my really good friend um, over, you know, over the time of getting to know her and being at the office and stuff, we became good friends. She's like, that's crazy. She's like, I'm shocked at Rick. And so then I was on lockdown for like, like four, five months. I couldn't lift my arms above my head. Like, and she's a hairdresser. So. Yeah, it was so, it was crazy. And it's so hard for me to just like let people do things for me. Like if you want to get a box down, like I couldn't, like it was rough, but Dr. Hujari said, he said, if you, if this doesn't work out, you have to start from zero. You have to start with the mastectomy again. You have to go and clear everything out. Oh and he's gosh. like, and I don't even know if that would work. It's easy to get down about life and it's easy to just like, oh, like go through your midlife crisis, right? Yeah. <laughs> like the yeah. monotony of everything. Yeah. And, and, and it's easy to be overwhelmed, but I just have to remember, like I was laying in bed last night with my little boy and I was just telling him how amazing he is. He's this incredible artist. And he just, he's, he's kind of insecure, you know, like mm -hmm. he's just, he's just a typical little boy who wants to fit in and he's a little insecure about things. And I just said to him, I said, Chapman, like I, my life was preserved so I could be your mom. Like, like you were blessed to me and I'm blessed to you. And like, just to be able to like watch my littles grow up is mm -hmm. like huge, mm -hmm. you know, like mm -hmm. it's so nice to like see my little nine-year-old and like what an incredible, brilliant artist he is. And my little girl who's just vibrant and full of life, like I just, I'm grateful, mm -hmm. like life. But tell them really quick what you ended up doing that was like, oh, had us all talking <laughs> at <Yes>! the gym. <laughs> I know. <laughs> my family makes fun of me a little because, um, so my plastic surgeon had brought it up several times. He said, do you have any plans to do like nipple reconstruction or like reconstructive tattooing? And I was like, I've never, I don't, I didn't think I cared. I was like, it like, listen, this is a mess. Like I'm used to it. It's totally so what fine. you guys have to understand is that on her breast, it is just flesh. Like it's just skin. There's yeah. no nipple. Because you have to keep in mind that like your nipples, as you know, they have their, they have breast tissue. They're so interconnected with the inside of your breasts that it's all tissue. And so, so I she like looks to... like, like a Barbie. Yeah, like there was not yeah, just nothing. a Barbie. Yeah, just there's no nipple, just a slit mm. and skin. Mm -hmm. And I honestly, I didn't really think it bothered me. Like I just, you said the fact, like I had breast cancer. Yeah, my boobs are a little wonky. Like yeah. that's just the way it is. Um, but my cute husband, like every now and again, he would be like, "Do you have any interest in doing the tattoo?" He's like, "I think you would love it." And I was like, "I'm fine." And then after he asked a few times, I'm like, maybe he would like it. <laughs> I'm like, maybe he's asking because he would like it. So anyway, I called the guy. His name is Mike Johnson, and he is so good. He has he says he has people fly to him all over the world. And he's here in Utah? He's a tattoo artist um, who specializes Never mind. in... The thumbnail is going to be nipple tattoos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. Nipple tattoos. So I go to him, and I just have this consultation and I just give him the heads up. I'm like, I don't really care. Like, uh, I'm here because more, I think my husband might like it. Um, and he was like, everybody says that. All women say that they don't care. But it is life-changing. I promise you it's life-changing. And so we made my appointment. One hour, like like an hour or less. Really? In and out, like 3D tattooing. Oh my like, gosh. But not like phenomenal. Like he's like, hey, go to the mirror and look at it. And I almost got teary eyed because I was like, oh my goodness. Like you like, realized what was going I, on. I realized that I just never looked at myself in the mirror anymore. Mm. Like I just, because it was so weird and it just, 
felt weird, but then just like seeing it all come together and like it looks 3D. I showed Julie because she was like, can I see it? I did. I wanted to see it. Yeah. And it looks like, I'm like, I had yeah, to like. like you have look. to like look twice. Yeah. Like you have to turn to the side oh, and be like, no, weird. that's not 3D. But so the tattooing, like it just was kind of the icing on the cake for me of like just feeling like back to normal as yeah. much as I could. Yeah. And so anyway, Mike Johnson, he's amazing. I and totally let's not forget, recommend it. She had to sit upright for it, right? Yeah, I so mean, he's yeah. just right here, like, <laughs> and he's like has like all these like mini pictures of nipples <laughs> on his computer. I'm like, this is so awkward. <laughs> he's like looking at all these nipples, and, and but he's like, so, Brian, don't come to this appointment. Yeah, I'm like, this is a little awkward, but he's so good, and he's like, he did such a phenomenal job. So it's been it's been oh, awesome. I'm so glad so, that's so awesome. So life to, goes to, on, to wrap right? Up, <laughs> what would you? I mean, like. How did this make you more of a gritty mama? You know what? I think that just, like I said, like, I think that we just try so hard to like live in comfort and be comfortable. Mm. But I think just sometimes like allow discomfort to come into your life. And I just, I don't know. Like my mom is, is so resilient. Like I don't know anyone more resilient than my mom. Like she lost twins, um, like her first babies. Like she just has always been so resilient. And I don't know if I learned that, if I was, if, if you're born with, I don't mm. know. Like, I just, I think for me, like one thing that I have read and just like reading about resilience is to be grateful. Yeah. And that's one thing that I've really practiced. Like I always, like, I just will always say prayers of gratitude and I try to, you know, if there's a beautiful sunset, I'll say a quick prayer and just be like, thank you. Like for blessing me with the sunset. Like, I think that when you have a mindset of gratitude, yes, it's so much easier to be um, resilient. So gratitude, honestly, like just try to find the good in what you have, you know, and it's hard and it's okay to be sad. It's okay to mourn the loss. It's okay yeah, to cry yeah. and it's okay to sit in that, Yeah, but, but don't sit in it too long, right, you know, like, right. like, well, it's like some people have, uh, they're grateful that they passed so quickly and they didn't have to suffer. But then there's also a blessing in the life being preserved too. Yeah. You know, and it's with, your, with your with your mom, with Michael, with you. I mean, there's purpose. Well, and it's here. true. Like my mom was, my mom's a, an amazing artist and she will sit with my kids and work on art with them. And then, you know, like she did their reflections pictures and we're, we just submitted pictures into this holiday art show. And, and when I'm around my mom, I'm just like, Sometimes I have to sit back and be like, oh my gosh, like, I can't believe that my mom is still here. I really didn't think she would be here, mm. you know? And I'm like, here's my mom. Like my kids know her so intimately. Like, yes, yeah, she's been through so much hard and she has fought, like fought so hard to live and she has had rough things. Mm -hmm. But like, I don't think that she, I mean like her life hasn't been easy, but she's still here. Right. And my kids know, I mean like how hugely blessed are we? And same with my brother. Right. You know, like the fact every time I'm with Michael, I'm just like He's still so here. grateful yeah. that we still have him. And well, and I think Laura, that your kids will say the same about you. Uh, yeah. I know. You're still here. <laughs> that you I were there will. for them and I think like, them. I know like just to finish up, I, the one thing that like I have heard people say is like, it's kind of hard to hear people like for me, what I guess what I'm trying to say is it's hard to hear some people be like, oh, like my mom's life was preserved. And then someone's sitting there, well, why was my mom's right. life not preserved? Right. And I just want to touch on that a little because the way that I spin my whole life journey is sounds really positive and it sounds really like, wow, like the Lord has intervened so many times and like blessed her so much. Well, where, why was I not blessed? Right. But I think that a lot of that honestly could be an attitude thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. cause I could go through my whole story and also make it feel really low right. and Debbie right. Downer. Yeah. And I think, so I, I just want to say like, I don't think that, I don't want to come off and sound like, oh my gosh, we've been so blessed and like, mm -hmm. we're so awesome. And like, we've had all these tender mercies. Like we still have had so many hard, like we've had so many things that weren't, mm. you know, like losing my niece, mm -hmm. that wasn't, there was no tender mercy there, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. but I just, had to I don't want it. anyone to feel bad that like, wow, like I'm glad her story has been no, so good. If anything, I think it, people it, feel that yeah, way, you know, but if anything, it helps even me <clears throat> to instead dig. If you have to dig, that's what, that's why the logo for gritty is, is in the shape of a shovel. You have to dig to find the good. Sometimes you have to dig oh, to find like, like what's totally. the inside silver lining to all of this because otherwise we'll just wallow in grief and 
shrivel up and 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 die emotionally. And we could. I yeah. mean, I could sit and be like, I have no feeling. Like it's changed so much. Like it's it sucks. Like it's so hard. Like I look weird. Like you know, like it feels weird. Like you know, like I could go and just like really sit in the negative, mm -hmm. but but then I could also just be like, guess what? Like my body is just like I'm, I'm here for mm -hmm. my kids. Like mm -hmm. who cares what my body looks like? Right. You know, and right. and like yeah, it's numb. But I just think that like. You know, I just don't want any, I just know that I've had people mention that to me, like that it's hard to sit and listen to someone be like, yeah, like I, so blessed. yeah, like, oh, like, like I was saved from this car accident and they're sitting there just have lost their right. mom in an accident, right. you know, but like we all have trials yeah. and trials are hard for everybody yeah. and yeah. just, yeah, like get your shovel and find the good. Right. That's right. my, that's my advice. <laughs> I'm not perfect at it. <laughs> if you, you should interview Brian next and be like, she's <laughs> not as positive. <laughs> She no, but there's, she... there's something to be said about that. And also, let's not forget, like, there's also the will of God. And if it's someone's time to go, it's their time. It's like my mom didn't want to lose her seven-year-old no. boy to bee stings. There's no tender mercy there, except for that maybe no. his life was prolonged a little bit because he had already had a kidney disease. But it's all in the way you look at it. And I am not preaching this because I am not good at it. I mean, unless, we're all learning. Unless I'm sitting in her chair and she, I'm like... Oh, it's so positive. I need, no. I need more of that in my life. But no. thanks for coming on the podcast. Uh, it's going to help a lot of people. I know um, I'll have a lot of messages about this. So I think people are going to probably be wanting Dave Johnson's name and number. Yes, seriously, he's so good. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, he's awesome. All right, you <laughs> and guys. And he does normal tattooing too. That's so. right. <laughs> <laughs> see, look, see, she, she looks fabulous. Oh, that's Check so it out. nice. She's checking out the bus I here. My, my big old sweater. <laughs> <laughs> All right, over and out. It's the Julie Jackson <laughs> Thank podcast. You. See ya. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <sighs>